Welcome to RISE Learning Machines Seminars. I am Olaf Mugren, and I'm a researcher on foundational and applied machine learning here at RISE. And RISE is Sweden's public research institute with 3,000 people working on a wide array of topics, including machine learning and AI for the benefit of society. This meeting will be recorded, and if anyone wants to be removed from this recording, please let us know. Uh, the recording with a, will then end up on our YouTube channel, where there's a list of other great talks from this series. Today, I am very happy to introduce Fredrik Gustafsson, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Karolinska uh, Institute. Fredrik received his PhD in machine learning last year from Uppsala University with a thesis towards accurate and reliable deep regression models, supervised by Thomas Schön. He is currently working in the group of Matthias Rantalainen at Karolinska Institute on machine learning and computer vision for computational pathology. The topic today will be how reli reliable is your regression models uncertainty under real world distributional shifts. And I'm really excited to hear uh, you talk about this, Fredrik. Uh, so please, the floor is yours and you can uh, now share your screen. Right. So thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation. This was basically said in the introduction. Uh, but I guess I can point to that the uh, oh, like, so my, my uh, the focus in the end of my research is sort of in building and evaluating uh, reliable machine learning models. Um, at least in the past, it uh, has, has often included sort of regression problems, answer transformation methods, and also quite a lot of sort of entity based models. Uh, and that's still sort of what I'm trying to do now, uh, but mostly then focusing on sort of problems from uh, from this uh, quotation of apology space, uh, which well, is also then uh, has some interesting problems related to reliability and uh, so on in the medical domain. And yes, yeah, so PhD from SAD last year, before that, did my master and bachelor in lean shipping. And the presentation. Basically, covers work that I did in Uppsala with my supervisors. Uh, it's mainly then based on this uh, QR paper last year. Uh, but it will also cover at least parts of the uh, previous paper on uh, sort of uh, a more sort of introduction to uncertainty estimation in or with deep learning in general. Uh, and yeah, so this is work I did in Uppsala, but this is still highly relevant for what I'm doing now and sort of things that I'm still thinking, about, thinking a lot about uh, also moving forward. And um, it's a summary, sort of quick of the, of the paper contributions. So what we do basically is that we, we sort of create this benchmark for testing the reliability of uh, uncertainty estimation methods specifically for regression problems under sort of various real world distribution shifts. And then we use that to sort of benchmark, uh, we, we use that to evaluate many sort of the most common uncertainty estimation methods. And basically what we find is that, I guess all methods are basically well calibrated when there is sort of no distribution shifts in like standard baseline uh, benchmarks or baseline baseline data sets, but they all sort of become uh, or can become highly overconfident on many of the, the benchmark data sets to sort of uncover some limitations of, uh, of the current methods and sort of uh, uh, points to that there is still sort of more work to, to be done to, to develop sort of truly reliable uh, methods for, for regression. And the outline is basically this. So first, quite a lot of background, just on sort of uh, some sort of general background on a certain estimation uh, for regression. Then also some sort of just concepts that's needed because we use them when we evaluate methods in the, in the paper. And then just like going through the main things in the paper with the sort of the data sets and the, uh, uh, the methods that we evaluate and then results and some, some takeaways in the end. Uh, so first of all, it's a like very general uh, setting. It's the case of I mean, regression problems. And then like the, the thing is the case you predict like a continuous target. Why? So it's not just like application, it's a it's regression, so it's a continuous target. And then in the paper and also in this presentation, then we will sort of exclusively focus on the one-dimensional case. So like the target Y is just like a single scalar. And the input space is always going to be, or the input is the input is always going to be some kind of, of image. And then I guess it can be said that the, at least the way I view uh, sort of a deep neural network or a DNN is 
nothing more than just like a, a parameterized function f data. Uh, so you snaps from some inputs x to some output. Um, and then exactly the architecture but is not important more than that I typically like divide the DNN into like two parts. So first like a backbone uh, feature extractor. And so you get the image and then if you get the feature vector g of x and then you have like a, a one or two or more sort of smaller uh, network heads, which then outputs like the, the final output of the model. Uh, but other than that, it's uh, it's just like a, a function with parameters theta. And the specific architecture is not, not very important. Uh, so that's basically regression and the architecture. And then just like to say something about like the, I guess the most common sort of most straightforward way of doing regression with sort of uh, deep learning is that you so let the network directly output the pretty target. So just output y hat with the network, and then you train the new network by minimizing the L2 loss or L1 loss over the training data. So, so that's like the most common, uh, most straightforward sort of direct regression approach to uh, regression using deep learning. Uh, but then sort of some background, the other background sort of uncertainty estimation. So I mean, of course, these DNNs have become I mean, basically uh, extremely popular, but I guess the problem is that at least in general, they sort of fail to, to properly capture like, the uncertainty in their predictions. And at least <clears throat> I mean, one approach that sort of aims to address this in a principal way is like Bayesian deep learning. At least then you sort of deal with the predictive uncertainty by uh, sort of decomposing it into two distinct types. So you talk then of aleatoric or data uncertainty, and epistemic or modal uncertainty. And so then the aleatoric uncertainty is basically like the uh, sort of inherent and irreducible uncertainty or irreducible ambiguity in the inputs X themselves. Whereas then the epistemic uncertainty is uh, that accounts for like the uncertainty in the modal parameters beta. And in general, that can be seen as a uh, some kind of reducible uncertainty, which is related to a lack of knowledge because of epistemic so knowledge related uh, uncertainty. And just like a quickly example of the electric uncertainty, you will basically have this input dependent input dependent electric uncertainty sort of whenever uh, some targets are expected to be sort of inherently more uncertain, uh, or when the target when the target one is expected to be inherently more uncertain for some inputs than for other inputs. So for example, you can have this sort of task of uh, automotive 3D detection. So the task is here to basically from this uh, align our point colors input, you need to or you want to sort of estimate the uh, position and size of the other vehicles in the 3D space. And then of course it would be that sort of for any model or for any human, it would be just given this uh, this point cloud, it would be sort of inherently more difficult to to estimate the position of uh, I mean a vehicle which which is very far away rather than if it's very close to you or if a vehicle is sort of partially partially occluded and so on. So just like given the input x, uh, I mean the or no, so just given the input, there's there's nothing that we can do. Some targets will just simply be or it would be simply more difficult to accurately estimate the target given that input. So some kind of uh, inherent ambiguity in the input, so that's the aleatoric uncertainty. And at least in principle, uh, if you want to estimate this uh, aleatoric uncertainty, it's enough to just sort of use the DNN to, uh, to specify a model of, sort of P of Y given X, so the conditional distribution of Y given X. Uh, so for example, you can use a Gaussian model so the network outputs both the mean and variance of the Gaussian distribution. So for example, you can just add like one more network head that outputs the variance. And then you can still train the network using or by minimizing the negative of vacuum and so on. And then, okay, so as a prediction, you can take the, the mean and then this variance is, uh, is sort of naturally interpreted as a, as a measure of this aleatoric uncertainty for the prediction. So at least so in principle, it should be also conceptually should be quite straightforward to, to estimate the electoral uncertainty. Uh, whereas then the, the epistemic uncertainty is much more challenging. I mean, especially that for like the DNN where you have oh, whatever, millions of parameters and so on. Um, that's, so it's, it's not enough to just model the people given X, 
to capture the epistemic uncertainty because basically you you completely disregard the the uncertainty in the mode of parameters data. And so basically, at least one setting where you will have large epistemic uncertainty, that's when you have like a large set of all parameters, which explains the data, the training data sort of equally well, or at least at least roughly equally well. And that will often be true for sort of the instance, like the, uh, the corresponding sort of optimization or lost landscape is going to be highly, highly multimodal. So for example, it's like a, a, a simple example to show. So it might be that the lost landscape looks like this, so like a small park looks like this. And so then just given this train data, uh, sort of the, these model parameters and these model parameters and so on, all sort of explain the data equally well. They all give the, the same training loss. So just given this train data, there's no way of knowing sort of which model parameters are actually like the, the best model parameters. Because just given this data, you can sort of distinguish between uh, these parameters and these parameters and these parameters and so on, because they just given the data, they all explain it equally well, or at least sort of roughly equally well. And at least what has been seen is that if you if you disregard this epistemic uncertainty or more uncertainty, then you're quite sort of likely to, or you can run into the problem that you sort of will get highly confident, but still uh, completely incorrect predictions then. And that's especially sort of a problem for when you get the inputs which are sort of null or sort of does it look like the train data, then that can be a problem. And I mean, again, so sort of doing the uh, or estimating some uncertainty is in general quite challenging. I and mean, then of course you could in principle do it by doing sort of broken Bayesian inference. So then you don't just find a point estimate of the parameters, but instead you try to find like the full posterior for the parameters given the data and so on. I mean, then that's sort of computationally very expensive, but there are at least some sort of crude approximations. So for example, you can even see like doing ensembling as a very crude approximation, because then at least you get like a set of whatever, five, 10 different models, which you can sort of, it can be interpreted as if you can sort of get 10 different samples from the, this lost landscape somehow. So at least you, you capture some of this uh, multimodality in the lost landscape, and therefore you sort of capture at least some of the, this epistemic uncertainty. But basically there, you know, epistemic uncertainty is much more, much more so sort of tricky to do, but at least there are sort of crude approximations to at least do it uh, to some extent. And I'll use like a simple example to show what this might look like. So we have this simple sort of 1D version problem. And so that we have a true, uh, data generators, we have a true P of Y in X, which is a sine curve as the mean, and then you have a variance which goes from basically zero to one, so like the shaded area is the, the variance. And then you get uh, train data, so you get 1,000 examples, but those examples are only inside this interval from minus three to three. So you have this region of the train data which is marked by the, the dashed lines. And then if you do the uh, so the, uh, the most common approach is this direct regression approach. So you directly predict the output with the DNN and you train using the L2 loss and so on, or L2 or L1 loss. And then you will basically get a model that, okay, yes, you can, I mean, accurately or very accurately estimate the, uh, the true mean function inside this region of the train data. So this, the red lines very close to the black line. But then of course, as you sort of move away from train data, this prediction might get, I mean, you know, basically very bad. So this red line is very far away from the true uh, mean, the, the black line. And of course, this is the problem with this model is that this, this model doesn't capture sort of any notion of uncertainty. So if you just get an input to the prediction, there is no way of knowing if you are in the uh, in the region where the model works very well or in the region where the model works or doesn't work very well at all. So that's sort of the, the overall problem that this model doesn't capture sort of any node of uncertainty. Whereas then if you instead, if you go to help us both the mean and the variance, and you're trained by using or by minimizing the natural likelihood, then you will basically be able to model the, uh, to model the, model the, model the aleatoric uncertainty. So then the, the predicted PYU next will basically match the true PYU next 
again, inside the 3D of train data. Uh, but if you move away from train data, you might, or again, then the, the estimated mean, the solid red line is far away from the true mean, but still then the, the shaded red, so like the estimated uh, variance, the estimated uncertainty is still very small. So basically here you then get that the model is, that is sort of overconfident. So because here the prediction, the predicted mean is far away from the true mean, so it's a bad prediction, but still the uncertainty is very small. So basically this is a highly confident yet you know, completely incorrect prediction, both here and also here, because here you basically have zero uh, predicted uncertainty variance. And then if you, uh, so if you do some kind of approximation inference, even if you do an ensemble, then you can capture this to so get sort of more reasonable behavior when you move outside of the train data. Uh, so again, the, the predicted mean still is far away from the true mean, but then at least also the, the estimated uncertainty sort of grows or, or increases sort of accordingly. So as basically pointed, it's, it's fine if your prediction is I mean, if you have a large error in prediction, as long as the model then also sort of grows increasingly uncertain, that's basically the, the overall point that I see. So the, 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 the desired uh, overall behavior. Uh, yes. So that's sort of the general sort of just uncertain estimation in regression, uh, what it's doing. And then some sort of more specific just concepts that we use in the aviation in the actual paper. So first of all, we have these uh, prediction intervals and coverage. So first of all, uh, if you're given a certain miscoverage rate alpha, so value between zero and one, then a prediction interval C alpha of X is basically a, a function that maps the input X to uh, some interval on the real line, because this is the one dimensional case. And this interval has a lower limit and an upper limit. And then this interval it should be so that the, this interval should cover the true regression target with probability one minus alpha. And then, okay, so if you scale, if you then give a, a, if you then give a set of n examples, then you can compute these sort of empirical interval coverage as exactly this proportion of the inputs for which the predicted or the prediction interval actually does cover the target. So for each input X, you compute the prediction interval, and then you check whether the true target is inside this interval, and then you check the compute the proportion of those which uh, for which that is true. And if this coverage sort of equals or exactly equals this one minus alpha, then we say that these prediction intervals are sort of perfectly calibrated. That's what you want if you specify, okay, so then, and again, we all, in paper, we always set it up equals uh, 0 0.1. So then the prediction interval should have a, have a coverage of 90%. So you specify, okay, this is a method for creating 90% prediction intervals. Then you want it, that to actually hold when you, when you value from some data. Uh, so again, prediction intervals and the coverage. And then for example, so uh, if you have a Gaussian model, as an F break up as both the mean and the variance, then you can sort of, uh, you can directly construct the prediction interval from the mean variance. You basically do the mean minus variance as the lower limit, and you do the mean plus the variance as the upper limit. And you scale by the, the CDF of standard refusion, so you get exactly the 90% uh, uh, quantiles. Uh, so basically there's a way, there's a simple way to give a Gaussian model, uh, create a, a prediction interval where you have the prediction, the mean in the middle, and then you have the, the interval. And so in, in that interval, the true target should be, should be contained at in 90% of all the for all the examples. And in a similar way, you can also do the construct an interval if you have an ensemble of Gaussian models, and then you can combine the uh, the ensemble of the Gaussian models into a single mean and a single variance, and then you can plug that into the same equation and get, again, get the, the prediction interval. So basically there is there is a way to, there's a straightforward way to, uh, from these sort of common uncertainty uh, estimation methods, create these prediction intervals, which okay, you have the prediction in the middle, and then you have a certain uh, size of the interval. So, so the 
the size of the interval directly then correspond to like the uncertainty of the model to the variance. So if the model is, or if the model outputs a, a very large uh, prediction interval, that means that the model is very uncertain. And if it outputs a very small, I mean very narrow interval, then the model is not very confident in the prediction. And, uh, yes. And one final concept also this could be selective prediction, which we also use for many evaluative methods. And so the, the sort of the general idea of such prediction is that you then you give the model the sort of the option to abstain from outputting predictions for some inputs. Uh, and you do that then by having a very combined sort of prediction model leading in a theta with some kind of uncertainty function kappa, which is maps input to, to a scalar. And so then if you're given an input, then you will output the prediction model only if this uncertainty function kappa is less than or equal to some threshold uh, tau. Then otherwise you use projected input and you, you don't have any prediction at all. And then here then you can also define the prediction rate, which is then the, uh, the proportion of input for which prediction is actually output. So I mean the, the general idea is just okay, so the model might output a prediction only for 90% or 60% uh, or even 10% of the inputs, but that's like a, an option we give the model that it can choose to use reject an input to say, no, not making a prediction at all because uh, the, the model is too uncertain. And in the paper, then we, uh, we sort of combine the selected prediction mechanism with the sort of standard regression uh, methods or the uncertain estimation methods. So basically, we we will output a prediction target and a prediction interval if and only if this uh, uncertainty function kappa is below this threshold. And the goal is then for, for the idea is that this should improve the, the calibration of the output prediction interval. So basically that the, the model is allowed to, again, the model is allowed to uh, reject some input, so it might output the prediction at an interval only for, uh, again, 60%, 50% of the inputs, but for those inputs uh, uh, where it actually outputs a prediction for, there the model should be calibrated. So you sort of allow it to reject some inputs, but when it actually makes a prediction, then the model should be calibrated. And so okay, then you need to design or determine what this uncertainty function kappa should be. I um, mean, there are many, many different possible choices. I mean, for example, you can just pick the, like, the variance of the Gaussian model or the variance of the Gaussian ensemble. But you can also then use, and this is sort of why we use this uh, selective prediction uh, approach, because then you can also use this to, to evaluate some sort of uncertainty scores, uh, which are used in like the uh, uh, anti-distribution detection sort of literature, so the OD detection, where I mean, the task is to more sort of just, uh, that task is more Simply define a use sort of distinguishing or separately and complete, separating completely sort of inputs which are in distribution from all the inputs. And then, I mean, in the literature, they use a bunch of different scores to sort of measure this uh, all the ness of an input. And like the, I guess the conceptually most simple sort of straightforward way to do all detection would be to like fit a model of uh, P of X on training data. And then uh, you would deem sort of any input for, for which this model of P of X the likelihood is small, then you would deem as OD because, okay, or according to the model, this input is not very likely. Uh, I mean, according to the model, our model of the inputs X in the training data, uh, according to our model for this, then this given input at test time is not very likely. So that would be OD. Question. Uh, yep. Would this, would the out of distribution detection, do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the, at least the problem I have with a lot of these OD detection papers is that they, the sort of the, the main way that you evaluate those methods is that you check, for example, okay, CIFAR 10 as the ID data set and then CIFAR 100 as the OD data set. And then you just check if you can, how well you can separate the interview data set from the OD data set. To basically do the AUC of okay, can we perfectly uh, distinguish, separate the Cypher 10 example from a Cypher 100 example? 
and then they do that with oh, many different uh, such data sets now. Cypher 10 versus uh, Fashion Amnes, Cypher 10 versus uh, SBHN, and so on. So, which can be so slightly arbitrary that you say that okay, this data set should be able to be perfectly separated from this other data set. So that's sort of the uh, the problem I have with the OD detection literature. So this is because it makes uh, so this is more related to uh, the sort of the problem in the literature, which is called uh, sort of misclassification detection, where you instead try to use some kind of score to detect when the model will misclassify sample. Because that's like the actually the, the, the interesting thing that not if you can perfectly separate I don't know cipher 10 from cipher 100, but if Actually, if the because there might be some examples in the, I mean that you lay have labeled as OD data set that the model might actually predict or classify well, and so I mean those examples you should not so sort of penalize a model for not being able to reject inputs which you have labeled as OD but which for which a model might actually be able to classify well. But the but the selective prediction it it kind of does and. OOD detection, does it? You yeah, exactly, but yes, I agree. But it's like it's uh I guess that's my uh my at least sense is that the selected prediction would be a more interesting way of evaluating all these numerous different OOD detection scores people do. I think, okay. I think that would be like a more practically relevant way of evaluating okay, this uncertainty score you have, can that be used to can we use that we plug it into the model into the data prediction mechanism in order to then get the model that, okay, so it can reject some inputs, but when it makes a prediction, the prediction will always be, I mean, not always be correct, but at least it should be, maybe you should then be able to get the same accuracy as you got on your validation data. So you can train a model, validate on some kind of, some kind of inter, internal data set, and then you set some kind of threshold or score, and then when you deploy the model, you can still, I mean, that at least would be like the, the ideal goal. You would be able to trust that, okay, now this model that I have trained and developed a little, when I go into deployment uh, by rejecting some inputs, uh, because you will probably encounter inputs which don't look like the trained data at all, but then by doing this select prediction and by being able to reject some inputs, then uh, at least, so when the model actually outputs predictions, then you can be Hopefully, you can be so sort of, uh, you can trust that those predictions should be good predictions overall, like the same level of performance that you were or accuracy that you got when you sort of did your internal evaluation. Don't you need this uh, out of distribution data set to, to evaluate your models as well? I mean, here I do the uh, I mean, that's what we do in the paper is instead to I mean, that we use this like prediction. To check if we improve the coverage, then when we move to our sort of data sets to test data sets with distribution shifts. Uh, so we don't say that, okay, uh, we don't check if the scores are able to perfectly separate data sets, but we train model and get the uncertainty, we get the prediction intervals, and then we move on to test data sets with, with some kind of distribution shifts. And then typically what we see is that. If you don't do anything, you just do the standard uncertainty estimation methods, then the coverage will drop quite a lot on those data sets. So basically, the model becomes overconfident. And then the mm -hmm. goal is that by doing this like, prediction thing, you will be able to like improve the coverage up to the, uh, the level that you sort of specify again by doing this rejection step. That's uh, basically the, the, the goal. Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Cool, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, like I said, there are basically uh, many, 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 many different sort of these OD detection scores. And uh, so you could train just uh, fit a model of P of X and use that. But that in practice is quite difficult if you have images and so on. So at least in the literature, they have found that we can get very good performance also by sort of indirectly modeling P of X by instead fitting sort of more uh, simpler models in the feature space. So you get the feature vector, and then you can fit the model on the just on the feature vectors of the training set, and that's what we use here in the paper. We we value two such methods, which are sort of 
uh, feature space density based. So uh, okay, yeah, so that's basically the uh, all the background. I used to remind myself as well. Used to the case test the paper. We did the did this benchmark to test the reliability uh, of a certain estimation methods under distribution shapes, and we used that to evaluate many sort of common methods. And again, what we find is that all methods are uh, well calibrated when there's no distribution shapes, but they can all become highly overconfident on these benchmark data sets with distribution shapes. So again, sort of uncover some uh, limitations of current methods. And you sort of very quickly on this motivation for where, when, why we sort of started working on this, this at all. I guess, I guess is that the, the paper was inspired and motivated by or at least at large sense of some concurrent work on ECG based prediction of electrolytes. So, I mean, ECG is like measures the uh, electro electrical activity of your heart. And then oh, these electrolytes, for example, like the potassium levels in your in, in your body, that's sort of connected to the heart. So then you can sort of measure the uh, concentration levels by looking at ECG. And the promise is that, okay, so these if you get sort of unusually high or low, uh, for example, potassium uh, levels in the body, that can basically lead to like very serious heart conditions. So the point is that if if you if you could sort of uh, uh, monitor this uh, these uh, potassium levels in the body sort of in real time by doing the uh, by having like an ECG based uh, regression model, that could sort of potentially I mean help avoid some uh, some pretty pretty bad uh, sort of uh, conditions. So that was the sort of overall. The problem we we studied, so it's a regression problem, and then we trained model and got some I mean, quite good uh, performance and so on, or quite good accuracy. But then I guess we sort of started work or started thinking, of, okay, but if we if we were to take this model to like the university hospital and try to okay, we now we should actually run this and let the clinic practice. So what requirements would that then put on the model? So what yeah. What does this model actually need to do or need to do if we actually were to take this to the to the, to the hospital? I mean, there are probably many different ways or many different things that you should be able to do, but at least then <laughs> the model should be uh, well calibrated. So I mean, in the sense that if it outputs a prediction and the 90% prediction interval for all inputs, then <laughs> it better actually achieve this 90% coverage on the inputs. Uh, because I mean, otherwise, if you reach a coverage which is lower than 90%, that means that basically the model is overconfident because the the prediction intervals are basically then too small because the cover the intervals doesn't cover the true target as often as, as it should according to the classification. So the intervals are too small, i.e. the model is not uncertain enough. Uh, and then at least it can be argued that okay, if you have a model that provides prediction and a uh, prediction intervals, so it provide, provides prediction and sort of an estimate of the, of the uncertainty. If that uncertainty is incorrect, so the model is overconfident, that's, at least can argue that that's even worse than just outputting a prediction. Because otherwise you say, okay, here, here's the model, it outputs a prediction, and then outputs a prediction interval, which in 90% uh, of all the times should cover the true regression target. And then if the, I mean, if the users of the model, if the doctors trust that, okay, this model will give them a prediction, a prediction to which covers target in the cases, and then you only get, I don't know, 60 percent, 50 percent coverage, then so the, the, the doctors will trust the model more than it actually should be trusted, because the model doesn't actually hold up to the justification that we did. We said there was going to be 90 percent coverage, but it just reaches 80 percent, 70 percent, 50 percent. So that's a big problem. And also then at the, okay, the model must sort of remain well calibrated also under sort of different types of distribution shapes that might be encountered in sort of practical deployments. So, I mean, it might, or it must stay well calibrated over, uh, I mean, over time. So if you could train it in 2019 and do it now, it should still remain calibrated, even if things happen in, I don't know, uh, the distribution of the people who go to the hospital and so on, or, yeah, many different types of shape that might be encountered in practice. If you train a model on uh, data from Stockholm and go to Uppsala or the other way around and so on and so forth. 
Uh, and just one sort of concrete example of the such a slow distribution shift from sort of the my current domain of computational ontology is just this example. So these are basically also tissue patches, uh, a collection of them extracted from uh, these big sort of hosted images. And then on the left, you have those patches extracted from, uh, from a lab in the Netherlands. And on the right, you have the same type of data, but just extracted from a lab in Sweden. And so then here, and depending on the, the way they sort of uh, process the, the physical um, slides and the way you scan the slides and so on, you, in this case, you get like a very clear sort of shift in the individual appearance and the, in the sort of color distribution of those two labs. So I mean, if you were to train the model only on the data from the uh, lab in the Netherlands and apply it to the Swedish data, that model would not work very well, probably, or the other way around. And at least in some sort of some preliminary experiments I'm, I've done, that's also what you get that the, if you train the model on only one domain and go to the other, then the performance can, can drop quite significantly. So yeah, this is the, there are many possible such sort of shapes that you might encounter in, in, in practice. And then, yeah, so finally, what we actually do in the paper is then that we okay, we propose this benchmark of different data sets with interesting uh, sort of real world vision shifts. So basically, we collect these eight uh, data sets, eight public available data sets uh, for these sort of image based regression problems. Uh, with different types of distribution shifts. So, I mean, for example, then like in this area of building pixels, then you have like the static images, and then you can train on images from uh, sort of two cities in the in the US, and then you go to a more sort of uh, rural area in Europe, and so on. So these are uh, for this one. You also train and test on data from different countries. And the same for this scheme uh, scheme lesion pixels also different countries are also use the same task, but they are captured in well, different sites or so on. So you get this, some kind of shift in the introduction from the train validation data to the test data set. Uh, and then, yeah, so two of them are also static data set, but the rest are uh, the, the, the other six data sets are real world data sets. Um, so roughly 6,000 to 20,000 training images, they're all uh, resized to uh, size sort of uh, 64 pixels four, so it's supposed to be a quite sort of, I mean, relatively large scale data set, but still sort of quite small and easy to use and sort of convenient to just uh, download and train models on and so on. Uh, and then so mainly what we have the models is, is in terms of this prediction interval coverage. So, I mean, the proportion of uh, inputs which for which the interval covers the target. So we basically check if the model sort of holds the specification. So the output is a prediction and a 90% prediction in total inputs. And then we check if the model actually reached this 90% coverage on the test set. So does the prediction intervals stay calibrated when we move from the relation data to the test data set? Uh, that's the secondary thing. And then we have some kind of select prediction methods. Then we do exactly the same thing, but then the prediction and the prediction interval will only be output for some input six. So only if this um, if the uncertainty function kappa is less than this threshold tau then. And so then you you only compute the this interval coverage on this subset of tests for which you output the predictions. So the model again, the model is allowed to. Uh, abstain from making prediction of some, some inputs, but when it does make a prediction for those inputs, you compute the coverage, and there the interval should be calibrated. Uh, okay, yes, and then you also then you need to check this prediction rate. So I mean the proportion of inputs which you output the prediction. So because it's important then to, to check if, if the model reaches I mean, this perfect calibration or close to but it does so by basically rejecting all inputs. I mean, that's okay, the model stays, it, it has stayed uh, well calibrated, so it's sort of reliable in that sense, but I mean, if it's just the, it only has a prediction for 1% of the inputs that might not, that might still not be so sort of very sort of useful in practice. If it just rejects uh, 
basically all inputs the that's defensive model. Uh, so that's why like this prediction rates like a natural uh, secondary map you also need to, to check them. And then some method that we evaluate. Uh, so you basically take sort of five common uh, estimation methods and they then all output a prediction and a 9 prediction total of inputs. And then we combine two of those with this select prediction mechanism. And there we use like four different uh, types of these uncertainty function kappa. As so we told, we have 10 different models or 10 different methods. And then we also, so for all methods, we sort of, we calibrate the prediction intervals on the validation data. So we get exactly the percent interval coverage on the validation data. And so then when we move to the test data, then ideally, we should stay at this 90%. So we shouldn't see a drop when we go from the validation set to the test set. And these are the five sort of common uncertainty methods. So you perform prediction, which is basically to, uh, you just train a model with the direct regression approach. So you just uh, output prediction and train with L2. And then you use validation data as some kind of calibration data uh, to basically you compute the residuals between the uh, prediction and the true targets. And then based on that, you get like a, a fixed length interval that you can add to, to all the predictions. Uh, and then the next step is basically doing an ensemble and then doing this. And you can have a Gaussian model, a Gaussian ensemble, and also quantum regression, where you basically let the, the, you let the training effort directly output the lower and upper limits of the this 90% uh, prediction interval. So you can train the effort to directly output those, those limits. Uh, but all of those just give some prediction and a 90% prediction interval for all, for all inputs. And then it's like the prediction, basically, uh, we do these five, and the two main things are then this uh, selected GMM and the selected KNN. So these are two such uh, feature, uh, feature space density methods taken from this uh, OLD detection uh, literature. Uh, so basically, you, you extract all the feature vectors from the training set, and then you either fit like a simple uh, Gaussian mixing model to those feature vectors. And then when you get the new input, you extract its feature vector and compute like the likelihood of the feature vector according to the uh, fitted GMM. And then the likelihood is low, that's deemed OD or deemed a, a high score. No? Or you do the KNNs and you basically you get the feature vector for the test input. And then you get the, you extract the K nearest neighbors among the training feature vectors. And then you look at the average distance to those such that if the distance to the training feature vectors is, is big or is large, then the, the input is sort of deemed as a, a more uncertain or it's deemed as OD. So that's basically the two main things. And then finally the results then. So this is, uh, I mean, quite a lot of information, but the interesting part here is mainly this upper row where we have the coverage on the testing asset. So this is the, like, the uh, interval length, which is also uh, relevant, but not as important to the, the interesting thing is this upper row. And so then here we have one, two, three, four, six different data sets. And then we have five to five different methods in the different colors. And so the basic point is that here we have two sort of baseline data sets, so this cells and the share angle, where we have no distribution shape between the validation and test data. And so for those two baseline data sets, we basically get like the, the desired expected performance or the desired expected behavior. That when you go to the test set and compute the input coverage, you get basically exactly this expected desired 90% coverage. So the test coverage is at 90% this solid gray line. So that's basically exactly what you want to do. You can take your model, train it, you can calibrate all the validation data, and then when you move to the test data, you still reach or get exactly this desired 90% coverage for the test data set. But then when you introduce sort of synthetically introduce distribution shifts, so two different variants, then the coverage drops a lot then. So it drops almost down to 50%. I mean quite so sort of significantly overconfident because the, the intervals are not large enough to cover the true target. In, uh, as, often, as often as it should, according to specification. 
And this is also the same for, okay, different data set uh, with no uh, shift. So it's perfectly calibrated, but then when introduced the different shapes, it drops down and becomes overconfident. And that's true for all these five different methods. Then. And this is just the, well, a very interesting thing. So you have basically uh, a data set, the same as before, the cells where you have no shift, and then you go to the uh, shift data set, but then you do it in steps. So you do it in one, two, three, four steps to sort of increasing degree of shift intensity. And basically what you see is that when you, okay, you step by step increase the sort of intensity or the level of the distribution shift, the coverage also step by step sort of decreases. The model step by step becomes more and more overconfident. And then we have the six uh, real world data sets. So I mean, for, for some of them, so like for these two, it works fairly well. So it's not quite, doesn't quite reach the 90%, but it's still close to 90%. Whereas for some, then it gets quite bad. So like this is the Gaussian model of this data set, then the coverage is down to uh, less than 60%. And so on. So basically, for most of these data sets, uh, all models have become at least sort of quite significantly, quite significantly overconfident. And it is also the case then that these two data sets that work at least fairly well, those are also data sets where the, where the distribution shift is sort of the uh, smaller or less severe than in, than in the other data sets. And then pretty quickly, so here we have the select prediction methods. And this is also quite interesting then. So here we have the uh, six data sets. We have four models. They're all based on this Gaussian model. So this green one is just the Gaussian, so the output the prediction and the interval of all inputs. And then we, on top of that, we add the select prediction mechanism with three different uncertainty functions, kappa. And so for the standard model, the prediction rate is just one because it always outputs a prediction. Whereas for the other, the, the prediction rate will drop a bit down to uh, 95% here or down to roughly 50% so on here. Well, so the point in this case, on so the base on the SF with no huge shift, all four methods are, are calibrated, that's nice. And then what we see here is that, okay, we introduced the distribution shifts on this data set, and then the Gaussian model becomes highly overconfident. But then when we, when we add this select prediction mechanism, the coverage goes up a lot and basically becomes perfectly calibrated by then decreasing the prediction rate all the way down to roughly 50%. So on this data set, this model rejects almost 50% of the inputs, but by doing so, it can then stay well calibrated on the, I mean, on the inputs it does output predictions for. So that was basically the, the desired behavior, but okay, you can decrease the prediction rate, that's fine, as long as you stay, I mean, Oh, calibrated or at least close to calibrated on the outputs or on the inputs for which you, you actually output prediction. So that's true for both these variants of this data set and also for these variants of this data set. And it's also then the case that we can see that this is these two methods, which are based on this uh, sort of feature space density thing. Uh, works much better than here than this like selective variance, which is just doing like the, the Gaussian variance as the uncertainty function. So in this setting, at least this, this feature based uh, based thing works quite well compared to uh, the like the just uh, the standard uh, Gaussian uncertainty uh, approach. So this is basically uh, exactly the desired behavior. This is like a very positive result. But then I guess the <laughs> unfortunate thing is that when we move on forward to the, to the real world data sets, then we don't see this improvement to, I mean, no, to the same degree. So again, we can compare the Gaussian model with like this Gaussian plus like GMM. So it's always the case that the coverage increases a bit. So the coverage moves a bit closer to the desired specified percent, but it doesn't really improve that much. Um, I mean, for example, in this case, the prediction rate drops to roughly 
So in this model, it rejects 30% of inputs, but still this coverage has just improved I mean, a tiny bit from roughly whatever 75% to 76%. Because in the synthetic data, we always saw that whenever this uh, prediction rate dropped sort of significantly, we also saw a big improvement in the coverage. So in these two settings, the prediction rate drops a lot, but then we also see this big improvement in coverage in all these cases. But for the real world data set, then it seems like okay, here the prediction rate can drop quite significantly without really improving the coverage that much at all. But so again, this it always improves the coverage a bit, but not really enough, and not enough to actually get really close to like a the perfectly calibrated, uh, perfectly or the the specified the desired 90% coverage. So that's the the problem basically. And then the takeaway from this is essentially then that again, this first one is key. So all methods are well calibrated on baseline data since it knows distribution shifts, but they can all become like highly overconfident in many of these uh, of these benchmarks. And therefore, at least the sort of takeaway I take is that it's probably quite important to make sure that when you evaluate methods, that you sort of benchmark them using sort of sufficiently realistic and sufficiently challenging, uh, I mean, challenging benchmarks that you, you don't just take some data, split it randomly into train validation tests, and then you see, okay, we train on, on train, uh, calibrate to val, and then, ah, yes, the collision holds when you go to test, nice. Because that's probably not realistic for uh, sort of data that you will encounter in more, uh, if you try to deploy something in, 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 in the real world, uh, because then you will, likely encounter some kind of diffusion shift either up. And at least results I have here shows that as soon as you have those shifts, the, the, the model can be quite so susceptible to that and actually like decrease quite a lot in coverage. I mean, decrease, basically become overconfident. And then the second one is this conform prediction, which I haven't talked about much at all, but the point is that these conform prediction methods, they have actually like, uh, theoretical guarantees on the coverage that as long as the so the calibration data and the test data is exchangeable so for example if it's iid then it will be exchangeable and if that assumption hold then you have a theoretical guarantee that you will get this desire or specify the coverage on average and at least <laughs> Some people sort of push this quite strongly that, okay, yeah, you should use co completion because then you have the, the, the regular guarantees that you will, uh, it's, it's, it's great because then you have reliable models, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is then if, if, if these uh, the regular guarantees sort of rely on assumptions which are not sort of very likely to hold in many sort of practical settings, then having those theoretical guarantees doesn't really help you that much. And it might just, I mean, I guess what I write here, if you, if, if you don't sort of critically examine these uh, underlying assumptions, having these guarantees might just sort of instill like a false sense of security. If you think, ah, oh, I have these nice guarantees, but actually they rely on assumptions which don't hold in, which don't hold in your setting, and then you basically know nothing, then the model can still become highly overconfident and you basically, yeah, having the guarantees doesn't help you at all compared to just having uh, other models which, which don't have this nice uh, theoretical guarantees. And the third one is also, I guess, this, uh, that sort of talked about that the, this, uh, these selected prediction methods based on these features based densities, like these selected GMN, selected uh, KNN, that they worked basically I mean, perfectly on the synthetic data sets, but they didn't really work on the real world data sets. And so, I mean, if you if you could sort of understand why it worked for synthetic data sets and not the real world data sets, I mean, that would be an interesting sort of direction to do more work then, because then at least potentially maybe you could find a way to get this method to also work on, on the real world data sets. And the final one is also like a more general comment, I guess, that the uh, seen in the paper is basically that, again, that these the feature-based density methods, they perform very well compared to other uh, methods, compared to sort of other uncertain information methods. So like the, 
the, uh, the, the uh, performance relative to other methods was good, but still like the, the performance in an absolute sense was still not good enough because the, I mean, the model still became overconfident. The coverage dropped from like percent down. Uh, and that's like a, it's a general comment. Again, that's, that's also something you, you very often see in many papers and also often like the OD detection papers, if you review for if you review those papers for conference so on, you always see, okay, we, we apply, we here's our new method, we have added in this uh, whatever open OD benchmark, and uh, yes, we get uh, new uh, stereo results, we beat all these baselines, but it's always uh, these uh, sort of perform or they only evaluate relative to other methods, and they never really talk anything about okay, but okay, this method is better than well, method A, B, and C, but I mean this method itself, is this method actually any good? And does this method actually work? Can we actually use this method to, oh, whatever, can we use this to, in a real setting, uh, reject sort of inputs for which the model will uh, output bad predictions? Maybe can, can we actually use this thing to like build a reliable model that we can actually sort of function in a real setting? Uh, so that's also it's like a young comment that, uh, just comparing methods, I mean, it's good, but you should also probably say something about the, the, the performance in some kind of absolute sense. If, okay, yes, method, method A is better than method B and C, but is actually method A any good? And yes, that is basically everything. Many contributions again, that's what I've said before many times. Uh, and then that's the web page. These slides are also on the web page. And then you can also go to the web page and post the feedback if you want the presentation. And, but yes, that's everything. All right, thank you. Thank you, Fredrik. And uh, we're a bit uh, late today, but uh, if anyone has any questions, please, uh, please uh, take the word. Um, I can I can start uh, chipping in that that. Uh, I'm thinking about what you say about realistic uh, distribution shifts um, and and that they should be realistic and challenging uh, when you develop your methods. Is is this always the same thing or always like realistic distribution shifts? Or is that the same thing as challenging distribution shifts? No, I guess not necessarily. I guess just, I was just more comment of the that the at least like the, the benchmarks you use should be, oh, I guess I said, sufficiently realistic slash challenging. At least they should be, they should be sufficiently realistic to sort of test, I mean, settings which you might encounter in the practical deployment. And mm. then of course it might be that the, I mean, the uh, deployment in some cases might not be like overly challenging. <laughs> And that might also be different different so settings, but at least the at least just taking like a data set and splitting it randomly, train well test that that I think is probably not so sort of sufficiently uh, realistic of the sort of deployment scenario. Uh, because I, I don't think you would get so perfectly just randomly ID data in that system. I certainly agree that this is an important point and that that you can certainly end up with with things that aren't challenging enough um, but then perhaps you also need some some ways to to sort of quantify that that's oh. apparently a challenging thing as well to quantify the the similarities and differences between data sets and between data distributions oh I mean that's, that's a very I mean, that's a great point because Yes, that's very that's very that's very difficult. I mean, all these. I mean, that's the problem with all the with the data set because, I mean, of course. I mean, I tried to sort of discuss that. Okay, oh, the uh, the methods work well or better on these two data sets, and that sort of intuitively seemed to correspond that the distribution shift was smaller in those settings. But that's just like, I don't know, like intuitively is looking at okay. In this setting, it was data from different countries, whereas in this setting, it was, uh, it was data from different continents, and then it should be a smaller shift. But I, mean, I agree, it's, uh, it's um, like uh, describing and uh, like uh, also sort of categorizing into different types of shifts and so on. That's uh, 
you know, not very easy and uh, something that we would need to, I mean, to do something. Yeah, but yes, I agree. It's basically an important, but I think uh, quite a difficult problem. Can I jump in with a question? Uh, so, uh, do we? Uh, uh, so I'm working on some classification problems, and how much of this is uh, valid for classification problems and not regression problems? You know, I mean, most of it. Like, I mean, the, why we worked on regression problems was just that, like overall, uh, uncertainty estimation and regression was sort of less commonly studied than the classification problem and especially like the calibration in regression is much less it's, it's less it's less sort of obvious or at least in classification there's more sort of a uh, a standard approach of doing okay, training with cross entropy loss and then like uh, measuring calibration with the uh, ece expected calibration error and so on whereas for regression it's more sort of an open question and people have to try many different things it's sort of less clear what's the sort of go-to approach in regression so i guess that's sort of why we did regression because like a, a less well-studied problem with more sort of open questions and so on uh, but i mean the the, the the distribution shapes is is i mean as as relevant for classification than as for, for the regression uh, and there are some at least uh, like one benchmark of the wild benchmark where they have different types of shifts for escape from and so on. So I mean, people have done work on that as well. Um, I guess it's just, I mean, of course you can do, and people have done, you can, you can for example, I mean, just measure the calibration in terms of ECE, that metric on some test data set, and then you can see if that holds under, I mean, test data set with different types of uh, distribution shifts. Uh, so people have done that before, uh, but they had not really done it for regression. So I guess that was, yes, I mean, basically the point is that the, this is equally relevant for classification, but the why we did it for regression was that people haven't really, or hadn't really done that for regression when we, when we did this work. Yeah. Uh, for the classification problem, you can have a shift in the sort of distribution of the input, but you can also have a distribution of the output yeah. so that uh, you're suddenly not seeing some of the classes. And uh, uh, can one say something about the sort of test coverage or the prediction rates and so on in these cases? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of what, what makes education I mean, both more are both more and less interesting slash more and less challenging because yes, then you can have because then you know, like I said, you, then, then you typically sort of distinguish between I guess so covariate shifts, which is just that okay, you still have the same classes, but the, the inputs just look different. So I mean whatever you might want to classify uh, objects uh, at daylight versus at night or you know, summer versus winter and so on. Like so you just you have the same classes, but then you shift these what the what the inputs look like. Or you have that uh, you can use you can also count these completely different classes at test time. So train or whatever train cat versus yeah. dog. So then you can count your horse at test time as well. Precisely. Uh, or that you, you uh, are, are training and you're only seeing ten percent of the classes that they exist in the overall database. Yeah. Uh, you're trying to do some federated learning and so on and uh so sort of, then you would like to have the model tell you that uh, th this input uh, i don't know about actually no, so, exactly. and i guess that's more than why or at least if you have sort of completely disjoint uh, sets of classes during training and testing that's where people do this more straightforward of the old detection that we can we should, we should just have some score that can perfectly separate the the data set of individual data and the data set with the OD data because they, they have different classes. So the train on just cats and dogs and then you are uh, tested whatever, horse and bird, then the model should be able to per perfectly sort of distinguish or separate to those two sets of images. Um, why would you say that, that, that there is, I don't see why there is a real difference between 
progression and classification in this sense. We can have, I mean, we call it label shift in 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 yeah. classification, and perhaps we don't call it that in regression, but but there could be a shift in the in the outputs, and there could be a shift in the inputs. There could be. Um, I mean, I, yeah. I I agree with that because that's basically at least in some of these data sets. That's exactly what we, but it's just that it's not as clearly defined in regression setting. Because, for example, mm. uh, when I create this cell's tails, what I do is that, okay, so the data set, I mean, so this is like uh, counting the number of dots in the image from, uh, it can be one dot up to 200 dots. And then how I create the shape in that setting is just, okay, so during training, you only see images with, uh, what is it, 50 to 150 dots. But then at test time, you can see images with one to 200 dots. Mm. But then yeah. the distribution shift is some kind of label shift that you see images with more or less, you know, bigger or smaller labels than you have seen during training. But it's not, the, it's not as clearly, at least for regression, I, I think it's just that the regression overall is sort of less well studied. So it's not sort of as clearly, people haven't really done the, the different terms for the, because, but, but the, I agree that it's, uh, but at least it's, uh, it's less clear. I mean, if, at least if you have a classification model, then you will use output. I mean, the logics for whatever 10 classes, and those 10 classes are the 10 classes you did use best factor in training. And then if you get a different class, that's something completely different. Whereas here, I mean, if the model is trained on, again, 50 to 150 dots, and you get an image with 200 dots, I mean, the model can still output. In principle, it could still output 200 dots. It's not. I don't know, I guess it's sort of less, a bit sort of more vague exactly what the model should slash, should do slash can be expected to do in that situation. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. I agree. Interesting talk and, and also an interesting discussion now afterwards. I think perhaps we should start wrapping up. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, and also welcome back next week. Uh, we'll have Yong Hao Chu uh, talking about machine learning for remote sensing, a little bit about adversarial attacks, a little bit about text to image in the and the uh, remote sensing uh, field, and a little bit about hazard modeling. That's going to be March twenty eighth uh, on on three o'clock in the afternoon. So welcome back then. Thank you again for today. Thank you. Thank you for interesting questions and discussion.